This is going to be what to do in the last days. No doubt about it, we're in perilous times in the last days of the church age. And there's some things we should do. Number one, you need to sharpen your sword. In these last days, you're going to come across false teachers. Ephesians 4.14 says that we be henceforth, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. There are blind leaders of the blind, and they'll just lead you into a ditch. But many men have pastors who aren't apt to teach. They are unprepared for any war on doctrine in the last days, and most Christians don't want doctrine. They just want the milk of the word, but they need the doctrine to help them grow. Second Timothy 4, 3 through 4 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. But doctrine, Bible doctrine is what makes the Bible come alive. And if you feel like men in your church aren't interested in the Bible, then just load them up with doctrinal teachings. Doctrine is what gets men interested in the Bible. Just like the comforting verses in Psalms get women interested in the Bible. You need to sharpen your sword if you're going to have any effect in these last days. It's crazy how some people who've been saved for 40 years have no idea what's in the Bible, have no interest in the Bible. They think it's a bunch of names. They have no idea what's in it. But Titus 1.9 says, Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Notice Paul's always talking about doctrine. He says, study to show yourself approved unto God. He says, give attendance to reading. So don't get to the judgment seat of Christ and have to ask Jesus, or have Jesus ask you, why didn't you read? Remember how Jesus was always saying to the Pharisees, have you not read? I'd hate to get to the judgment seat and the Lord Jesus Christ tell me that I didn't read enough or that I didn't study enough. So seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. And there is no reason you should be deceived by false teachers who are teaching things like replacement theology. You should know when Paul says in Romans 11 that all Israel shall be saved, that it's obviously not referring to the church because we're already saved. You should understand how that God deals with the Jews in the Old Testament, the church in the New Testament, and the Jews again in the time of Jacob's trouble. You should know why the rapture of the church isn't in Matthew 24. But the second coming is in Matthew 24. You need to do. You need to know that salvation is by grace through faith in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that any person can be saved, no matter how much wicked things he's done and perversion he's done in their life. They can still be saved because Jesus Christ is a whosoever will God. I believe you should know how to define. These Bible words that preachers don't use anymore, things like imputation, justification, propitiation, redemption, the spiritual circumcision, all the doctrines of salvation, that's how you get assurance of salvation. Uh, a soldier in the Lord's army in the last days will need assurance of salvation. And many times teachers and preachers don't teach these doctrines of salvation and their, their followers swords aren't sharp for the last days. They're weak because they don't have assurance. And this is how they get tricked into doubting their salvation by their holiness grandmother-in-law or their Church of Christ uncle or their oneness Pentecostal who stalks them around at work and tells them they're not saved because they haven't been baptized in Jesus' name only. Uh, you should teach your people these things so they're not deceived. You should know what the Godhead is, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. They are one in three and three in one, three distinct persons, yet the same God, three persons, not three separate gods with their own body, soul, and spirit, but one God in three. There's three that bear record, and the, the, those three are one, as the Bible says. You should know at least that much 
about the Bible. And you should know it is too complex, the, the Godhead is too complex to start dividing over it and causing strife about how each other explains it because I can't explain it. Are you trying to be like the carnal Corinthian church? So teach doctrine, but don't spend your time arguing about doctrine. You need to learn why works don't have to do with your salvation. A changed life is a separate issue from the salvation itself. Uh, we don't do good works to get saved. We don't do good works to stay saved. The works are a separate issue. Learn the doctrines of salvation and you'll see that only the work of the Lord Jesus Christ is what salvation is about. A person needs to understand that claiming a sodomite can't be saved is not a Bible teaching, and that just makes you more of a works-based salvationist than someone who teaches lordship salvation. Uh, you should know the difference between easy believism and easy prayerism. It's easy to be saved. It's easy to believe the gospel. All someone has to do is realize they're a guilty sinner and come to Lord Jesus Christ and believe on Him as the crucified, buried, and risen Savior. And if a person believes that in their heart, they're saved. But if they pray a prayer without the heart belief, then that doesn't save anyone. What you should be against is easy prayerism. You need to learn what these terms are. You need to learn what's wrong with these things because people are arguing back and forth. You know, They're saying, I, he, I don't fellowship with him. He's an easy believist. But everyone has their own definition of easy believism. If their definition of easy believism is when someone comes to you and says, pray this prayer and it'll save you. And the person just prays the prayer and don't believe it in their heart and they're just saying it to get rid of a person, then that's wrong. But if easy believism is saying that it's easy to believe the gospel, then I'm, I'm an easy believist. What I'm against is easy prayerism where a person will say, I'm saved because I prayed this prayer. And they don't even know what they're praying. They don't understand the gospel. They don't understand their need for a savior. Then that's not salvation and that's wrong. But you need to know these things. You need to find out what these terms are that people are arguing about. And next, you need to seek wisdom and counsel from the right people. You don't want to be like... Rehoboam in 1 Kings chapter 12. Who listened to all the young people guys his age instead of the old men something wrong in these last days of the church is that many people are listening to all of these 32 33 34 35 year old pastors and preachers who are rebuking and correcting all the old preachers and it's like they're in their mind the lord has raised them up in these last days to straighten everybody out and i'm barely 30 myself so I don't have the wisdom and knowledge and experience a 50 or 60 or 70 year old saint and the Lord has. And that's just common sense. I don't want to be puffed up in my knowledge. And I don't want to think I've arrived and that I'm just, I'm just great or anything. I don't know everything. I don't know half of the, half the Bible. You don't want to start thinking you know everything. You don't want to take it too far the other way, and you don't want to be like the young prophet in 1 Kings 13 who listens to the old prophet over the Lord. So just because an older guy says something, it's got to match the Bible too. But as a general rule, I'm going to listen to what the old preacher says before I listen to what the young preacher says. The Bible being the final authority, of course. But why would you take advice from a, a young blood, 35 years old, who's condemning the old preacher who is 65 years old that's been preaching 45 years. That's crazy, and that's why people are so messed up. You say, well, the old preacher is wrong on some of his doctrine. So what? The young preacher can't even instruct you on the milk of the word. That's why he acts like such a cocky idiot. And if you can't even be nice to a waitress, the last thing you need to do is talk about Bible doctrine. If you can't even follow the instruction and righteousness parts of the Bible. If you can't even be nice to your brothers and sisters in Christ, then you need to stay with the milk for a while. Go through the Pauline epistles and underline every time he talks about treating your fellow brother and sister right. You're not going to know how to live in perilous times when you take advice from a smart aleck, novice, 
when you take more advice from them than an old man who's been saved for 50 years, who has been through the trenches. You can learn from young men. I mean, they have to start somewhere. But when the young men are telling you that all the old men are wrong, I would check up on it. I was listening to a young preacher the other day, and he said Sammy Allen is going to hell. He said Phil Kidd's going to hell. He said Lester Roloff and Peter Ruckman are in hell. So I'm thinking, well, God must have raised these young guys up to tell us who's saved and who isn't. But it's all nonsense. These guys claim to be easy believists, yet they're the one going around judging everybody's salvation or not and judging everybody's salvation off whether or not they believe just like them. It sounds like they're hard believers, like they, they're making salvation harder instead of easy. So why people call them easy believers, I have no idea. But I'd watch it when you listen to someone that's just constantly saying, this guy's not saved, this person's not saved, this person's in hell, that person's in hell, because you don't know the heart of the person. And next, what to do in the last days stray away from the sins in second timothy three if you want to survive these last days find out how the world is going in the last days and go the other direction and second timothy three tells us how the world's going it says in second timothy three one this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come for men shall be lovers of their own selves and someone said the other day love yourself first but that's a lie because the Bible says we love him because he first loved us. Uh, Jesus loves you enough to come down from the glory of heaven and die for your sins. The Bible says greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Uh, nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And Jesus loved us enough to come down and die for us. When Jesus was here, he was putting others first. Uh, a sodomite was successful in living out his sinful lust and marrying another man. And he said, love wins. In the last days, the word love and is nothing but lust. Very satanic lust. He, he married another man because he's a lover of his own self. He didn't really love that other person. He loves his own sin and his own self more than he loves anything. He's actually just a hater of God. But what else does it say in 2 Timothy 3? It says, Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. So the world is set on making us want everything we see. It wants us to covet. And the advertisements are designed to make us covet. Women dress in a way to make men want them instead of their own wife. They are led by the devil, devil when they do this. The Bible teaches not to covet your neighbor's wife. Uh, video games, as I talked about the other day, the Fortnite game, it's just it's making its money off making you covet more and more, putting out new uh, material on the game every week at outrageous prices for basically just an image to make you covet and make so they can make more money. And also don't boast and think to be something. Second Timothy 3 talks about boasters. Don't think you're something when you're nothing because when you do, you're deceiving yourself. Why do you watch shows on TV that blaspheme God? Second Timothy 3 talks about blasphemers. And I don't like for people to blaspheme the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. Uh, he lives in me. I'm in Him, and if you're saved, you have Christ in you, the hope of glory. So why sit on your couch and listen to people taking the Lord's name in vain? Why would you watch something that blasphemes God? Why would you blaspheme God yourself? And if kids are listening to this, if you want to know what to do in the last days, then don't be disobedient to your parents, as Second Timothy 3 talks about. If you can't mind your parents, then you'll rebel even more against God when you get out on your own. Second Timothy three three says, Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. So false accusers, you could park on this one forever. 
I haven't heard people talk about this one much, but what you have today among Christians is constant false accusations. And you never seen so much slander in your, slander in your life. We know what to expect from the lost world when they li lie about Christians, but there is nothing more disgusting than when a Christian lies and false accuses another Christian publicly. And it's only amped up more by social media. All you have today is a bunch of big jealous babies getting on YouTube and Facebook and tilting their, titling their so-called message, such and such preacher exposed and uh, just to get more views and to get more people to watch the video because people love drama more than anything. They'd rather listen to drama and people slandering, slandering each other, backbiting each other more than they would more than they care to listen to Bible doctrine. But all their videos are about is slandering each other, saying each other's not saved. Uh, but you're full of hell if you do this type of thing, and you're not prepared for the last days. You're more concerned about being the greatest. You're a boaster. You're concerned about looking like the greatest uh, teacher or preacher in the world. But you're only working for the devil when you're disguised in your whole armor of God. You're trying to get people to think you're a soldier in the Lord's army fighting false doctrine, but really you're a traitor, and you're just really concerned about looking like the greatest Bible man in the world. But these guys actually pretend that they're contending for the faith when all they're doing is bad-mouthing every Bible preacher that's been alive for the past 50 years. When every single title of a YouTube video by a person has another preacher's name in it, I would beware of that person. That's not helping God. You're just discrediting men that Christians have gotten help from for the past hundred years. When what you have today is a bunch of pastors who are in their 30s on YouTube bad-mouthing men like Sammy Allen and Peter Ruckman and Lester Roloff, Billy Sunday, and all the old preachers that was preaching the Bible before they were even born. And these young pastors were teenagers watching MTV when these men were out preaching. I just turned 30 not long ago, and I got saved when I was 21. And I know better to think that I know more than a man who's been preaching and reading the King James Bible for 30 years. Even if he teaches some stuff that's not right, he's still bound to know more than me. He's still bound to be wiser than me. So watch out before you listen to some young pastor who's just trying to make himself a name. Like the people at the Tower of Babel. They said, let us make a name. Some people are only concerned with making a name for themselves. They're not wanting to exalt the name above every name. But 2 Timothy 3, 4 says, Traitors, heady, high-minded, Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. If you haven't seen this, I don't know where you've been. People are only out for pleasure. If there really was a button that said pleasure on it, they would hit it all day and constantly have to get it fixed because that's all they care about. But you don't always have to do what the flesh wants. Get up early. Take a cold shower. Skip some meals. Read the Bible. Pray and go out and work with your hands. Get a job. If you want to be a soldier in the last days, make your flesh upset a while. One of the best things I've done is had an extremely hard physical job and work 10 to 12 hours and listen to preaching through headphones for those 10 to 12 hours. That just beats down the flesh. But the last days are all about the flesh. The music's all about the flesh. Even the Christian rock music in churches is all about the flesh. When it gets to your feet and your hands before it gets to your, your heart, then there may be something wrong. Second Timothy 3, 5-7 through 7 says, Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away, for of this sort are they which creep into houses and leave captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. That's soap operas and The View and the Kardashians and whatever shows on TV now that's teaching women how to sin and be even worse mothers than they already are because they'd rather go out with the girls than read their kid a bedtime story. 
Verse 7, ever, le ever learning and ever able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Education without salvation is damnation. And what's increasing in the last days as we get closer and closer to the time of Jacob's trouble is transportation, communication. People are increasing in knowledge as, as the Bible talks about in the book of Daniel. But education without salvation is damnation. They're ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. What's the truth? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. They never believe in God. They believe in themselves. Uh, one time I knocked on, I was knocking on doors and this girl said, I don't believe in God. I believe in science. They just believe, they have faith, but their faith is in a textbook. It's in a professor. So they have their own religion. But they don't believe in the God of the Bible. They believe in the God of this world. Their education has taught them out of the Bible. Even though the book of Romans says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And what that saying is, you may not be able to actually see God, but you can see God and that He made everything you see. The trees, the grass, the mountains. Uh, and you say that there's not a God. So, but you're, So you're without excuse. But they're scoffers, they're mockers. Second Peter 3, 3-4 three through four says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last day scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, Where's the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Educated atheists today are scoffers when they see a street preaching sign and they laugh. When they see a Bible verse on a billboard, they laugh. When they see a preacher say, Jesus is coming, they laugh and say it's stupid. They say, I've heard that for years. But be ready because we are in the last days of the church age and the tribulation I believe is right around the corner. You need to be sure that you and your family are saved and everyone can be saved by believing in the gospel. And Paul gives us the gospel in 1 Corinthians 1 through 4. He says, I declare unto you, first of all, that which you also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So the gospel is that Jesus Christ died. He died by shedding his blood. He died for your sins. He was buried and rose again the third day. He died for your sins because you're a sinner. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You need to realize you're a guilty sinner. Realize your guilt of sin. Realize you can't save yourself. You need to realize that Jesus Christ is your only hope and your only way out of an eternity in hellfire. And if you'll come to the Lord Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner that you are, and believe on Him and His finished work on the cross to be your payment for sin, then you can be saved and have eternal life. You can be eternally secure. You'll no longer have to worry about going to hell ever again if you'll just come to the Lord Jesus Christ right now because today is the day of salvation. Romans ten thirteen says, For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And before you even get the words out of your mouth, if you... If you really believe in, in the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll have already believed in your heart to salvation before the words even come out. But this has been what to do in the last days.